Welcome back to the channel. Today we have some retro packages to unbox and, some, and, I, have, and I have some stuff to show. So let's uh, dive right into it. The first package, and I already unpacked these packages, um, is this stack of games. And in case you're wondering why there are yellow lines here, um, this is just some kind of orientation. I have a, a camera mount which is on top up here and uh, to make sure that you can see what the phone is recording I have this yellow line so all in the yellow line will be properly recorded yeah I got these off of eBay and uh, that is a, a curious story um, because I was on eBay and I noticed that someone was uh, listing new items and um, yeah, stayed online and always refreshed and then there came Atari 2600 games and other stuff and it was all super cheap. So I, I guess I bought, I bought this Joust for two, two euros. Um, the box was a little crunched up here, already brought that in order. But other than that, this is in super good shape. Even comes with the manual and all the stuff. So two bucks, good price. Next up we have Moon Patrol, same thing, two bucks um, with the manual and the, the cartridge. Let me get that out of here. Looks like never been used. And manual in really good condition. Last but not least we have Dick Duck for the Atari and that is um, cartridge only, which was not listed as such, but still nice cartridge. Uh, great game, I love this game. It's uh, one of my all time favorite classic arcade games. And last but not least for, I guess, 10 euros, which right now is about $10. I got Buck Rogers Countdown to Do Doomsday from SSI Strategic Simulations Inc. The box was pretty severely crushed. Uh, show some pictures here. But I took my my iron, not the soldering iron, the other one, and uh, flattened the box from the inside. So I have uh, travel iron and uh, that worked pretty good inside this smaller box. Comes with a two disc. By the way, this is the Amiga version, which is um, relatively rare. And you can even install it on a hard disk, so we might try that um, in a future video. It comes with all the uh, rule book, log book, uh, info card, and even some handwritten notes from someone who obviously played that a lot. Yeah, I remember playing this, and that is a role playing game um, in the Buck Rogers universe, so. Pretty nice, pretty nice. Maybe. maybe we do a game session on my recently restored Amiga 2000. That would be nice. Next up, I got this thing of beauty from the UK. You can spot this by the UK plug here, which I can't use, so I have to unscrew this and uh, put in a new one. Interestingly, all the UK plugs I got so far are fused, so there's a fuse inside the plug. Let me show you. Um, other than in German plugs, where there is no fuse, and the fuse is usually in the machine itself, the UK, for some reason, does have this. I don't know about the American plugs or the Australian ones. Um, so if you are from Australia or America, just let me know. So here's the fuse. Um, yeah, interesting. At least I get a fuse every time I get uh, one of these plugs. Not much to see here, elsewise. This is a computer program data recorder. Um, in Commodore world we call that a data set. But 
this thing is universal so you can just plug stuff in here and use it with a spectrum or any other machine i guess uh, maybe except for the commodore machines because the commodore machines did all of their data conversion inside the data set. So the data set had some logic, some um, analog to digital logic. And uh, these machines just provide the analog signal. It's sold as um, broken or for repair. All the keys are pretty crunchy. It's pretty grimy also. But um, according to the seller, it's only the belt that has to be change so this is a nice restoration project it's in really good shape except for the dirtiness but this will make a pretty nice data coder once um, I cleaned this and repaired this and uh, I can use this with some other 8-bit machines next up we have a project which I really liked and that is by fusion retro books and these guys also do these fusion, um, what can we call this, manuals or anthology magazines. This one is about Final Fantasy, so they made a magazine which is only about Final Fantasy. And these guys made a book, and that book is the Commodore 64 Collector's Guide to Mastertronic. Mastertronic, I don't know if the, these existed in the US, I guess. Uh, Mastertronic was a company that was founded to provide kids with computer games, cheap computer games, and um, there was a so-called 199 range, um, which was 199 pound, and you could buy games for that, it says here 199. Um, so it was, um, I think, if I remember correctly, I haven't read the book entirely, um, founded Mastertronic in the UK and was later bought by another company, I guess Virgin, and then they uh, did all kinds of stuff. So there's this 199 range by Mastertronic and this book covers all the games that were released by Mastertronic and it's, let's call them sub-labels. Um, which is quite interesting because I had a lot of these Mastertronic games um, like Chiller or Kane or Finders Keepers. Um, my favorite still being Master, Master of Magic, Masters of Magic. I guess it was Master of Magic. You can look that up and you can see this is a more than 500 color page book which was on Kickstarter, I paid, I guess, 35 or 39 bucks, including this Final Fantasy book, which I'm not too interested in, but it's for free, so I'll take it. And they actually came through with the, with the Kickstarter, and it only took them, I guess, two months from uh, give me your money to here's your book. And um, yeah, it's the interesting story of Colin Poole, a guy who then started to collect the Mastertronic games and found out how many there are actually. And um, every game has its own at least two pages with a sales rating, which is, in my opinion, as someone who, who is, uh, who's a business person, very, very interesting to see how well a game sold and uh, trying to figure out what, what's the mechanic of why this game sold and another one didn't. Uh, like say uh, that here, Gepler's uh, sales rating just one star and here 1985, the day after sales rating five stars. So why did this game sell so much more than this? And it's not always the quality of the game. Um, there's sometimes um, some quotes from game magazines and reviews of this game magazine, like here reasonable but dated shoot them up overall, overall 51% uh, from ZZAP64. And it starts with all the Mastertronic games and uh, there are quite some of them. And it then, let me quickly check, Mastertronic, Mastertronic. It then um, heads over to another label, which is the 
MAD Games or Mad Games, Mastertronic Added Dimension, and they were sold. Um, blah, 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 blah. I guess still for one ninety nine. Oh no, it's two ninety nine for these games. And there are also quite a lot of these. And these are the Mad Games, and there there's the last we ate, which I guess. Everyone who owned a C64 owned last Wii 8. But still, it's only a five star game in terms of sales. UCM, one star. As I said, it's not always the, the quality of the game. This looks awesome, looks a bit like uh, Spin Dizzy. And it's still just one. Oh, okay, got 11%. Maybe it wasn't really a good game. So maybe there's actually a correlation between the sales rank and the quality. But you have Void Runner, which has an overall of 85 and just two stars. Um, and then you have the Mastertronic Plus games. And then you have the Ricochet label. And the Ricochet um, da -da -dum, doesn't say for what it's sold. I guess Ricochet had aliens. They did actually um, re-releases of games that were already on the market. Let me quickly check. I guess this is the one where they did um, the Ghostbusters re-release. I guess that was the Ricochet label. Let me quickly check. Yeah, that's Ghostbusters. And Ghostbusters is, I, if I remember correctly, um, together with Chiller, the only one which has a six star sales rating. Which is uh, quite interesting. And you see here's a brand like Judge Dredd, which was big in the 80s. Mission Impossible, which, oh, Impossible, no, it's an Impossible Mission, which only had two, two stars. Bastard, which has zero stars, which is uh, quite an achievement. And Hacker, which only had one star. So that were uh, good games, but the sales rank didn't reflect that. Yeah, this book is a great book for everyone who is interested in the history of Mastertronic and the games that were, and you get a complete list of all the games. So if you are starting to collect, that is the way to go. Um, there are other labels like Entertainment USA and some others. And ah, here's the complete sales rank, the top 10. Ghostbusters, yeah, Kickstarter. Kickstart, BMX Racers, Chiller, Double Dragon, Kickstart 2, Speed King, Formula 1 Simulator, Action Biker, Kane. You can see these all racing games here. So maybe there's some um, something to this. And they list all the games. Bulldog was another label. Racket, Americana, Tronics, Master Adventurer and some compilations. Yeah, next up, they are um, planning to do the same. And that is why there's a one here. They are planning to do the same for the Spectrum. Um, and hopefully for all the other platforms, because I really like this kind of book. It's an interesting read. It's just interesting to see what kind of games there were with all the screenshots and the short descriptions. And um, yeah, I really dig this book. So 500 pages of goodness and keeps you entertained at least for a day or two um, reading through this and if you start collecting this is I guess uh, indispensable so you must have this book yeah I guess you can still buy this um, via the fusion retro books website if so I will put the link in the description below if you're interested no affiliation whatsoever then we have something I stumbled over on the internet, uh, eBay to be precise, and that is, let me quickly get these the stuff off here. Um, uh, I found this, which is the Versa 64 card, and I already built one, and this is a cool reset switch for the C64. No, it's not. So this is a cartridge for standard 27 whatever EEPROMs and you can configure these with the um, jumpers and the dip switches 
and you can use this um, to create your own modules and cartridges and stuff like that and just put in a burnt EEPROM of any 27 kind and configure it here and uh, yeah, away you go. And the cool thing is this is pretty well documented. So there's loads and loads of stuff on how to do this, how to configure this correctly. So um, using the WinVice or Vice emulator, uh, which give, has a specific tool to show you which configuration to, to choose here. And the parts you need are pretty um, remarkable because you can just do this with um, instead of putting all the stuff here with just the socket and I guess one resistor if I'm not completely mistaken and you then just solder on the solder points here you can see here solder points instead of these using these and uh, yeah if you're just looking for a cheap way and I bought this for I guess three euros and seventy cents uh, the bare um, PCB, no, two of the PCBs for three, seven, uh, three euros seventy cents, and I had the stuff which I needed except for the dip switches lying around, so that wasn't a big investment, but uh, that will set you back maybe let's say two or three dollars depending where you buy this or euros. It's not much stuff. It's all the same resistors and uh, a few pin headers, a few jumpers like these you can add a reset switch but you don't have to and two diodes uh, which are the same and one uh, cap I guess and a socket but you can still solder to the PCB directly and then you have a super um, cheap and easy way to create your own modules or cartridges which is quite nice I first thought about doing a video about this, but I'm not sure if you are interested in how this works in more detail or how to build this, uh, put it in the comments, but it's so straightforward that I don't see a video there, except all of you or many of you want one, then of course I will do one. Which brings us to the final item of this video, and that is called the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. And I was looking into playing Tetris on my Game Boy and I picked it up. It was, I had it framed, so it was behind some plastic and I had to get the frame down and get it out of the frame to use my Game Boy. But the problem with the Game Boy is it has a very dim screen. And yes, you can do a screen replacement, which will set you back about, I guess, 40 euros for the screen alone. And you have to do it and it's fiddly and not that I shy away from any repairs or modifications but somehow I like my Game Boy the way it is which is original and uh, factory so I was looking into options to play retro games and there's always one option which is to use a Raspberry Pi but that is uh, let me show you so here's my Game Boy it's a bit yellow if I switch it on you might or you might not make out the screen and what's on it. Let me try to get. So this is the way I play Tetris and this is good lighting here, but you can't play in the dark. That's uh, only possible with the GBA, which has a backlight, a Game Boy Advance. So I picked up this GPI case, which is an interesting construction. First, I was looking to get into this to, uh, you can use batteries or you can um, use the um, wall ward to get it powered. And this is a shell for a Raspberry Pi Zero. So I thought, okay, how do I get into this? How can I open this to put the Pi in? Turns out you can't because the Pi is in this shell up here. So the Pi plugs down here and connects to the system which you can't open. So this is okay. Controls are okay and uh, screen is, yeah, okay, not, not so great. 
it's a bit smaller than the normal Game Boy. You can see there's some green stuff running along. But it doesn't do jack. Yeah, so problem is if we open this up, let me open this up. Okay, here's the deal. You open this up and you have this board inside. And this board has these contacts which are on little springs. I don't know if you can see this. And these push onto the GPIO pins up here. And you can see I had a, a Pi Zero with some pre soldered pin headers here. So I had to desolder the pin headers, which is a pain on the Pi Zero. And here are two wires, and where these two wires were, there was originally some USB flat cable, which connected to the USB port right here, which actually connects the controls of this to the Pi. So all these connections are for the screen and um, stuff, and they are only the only contact they make here is through the this lid and the screws which you put in here. So that is a very shitty way of doing things. And here's the Pi Zero, uh, which I have soldered some wires to, so that because th that flat ribbon cable was just broken. And even if this would work fine, which it did for a while, uh, this sandwich this just overheats so there's no way to do some proper heat sinking or stuff like that in here and the pie just overheats and after a few minutes it just breaks down so not cool so the question was what to do about this what can i do to play my retro games on the go and in came the Redroid Pocket 2 Plus. I did some research on the internet, uh, read all or s viewed all the YouTube videos about these portable uh, devices and ended up with this Redroid Pocket 2 Plus, which uh, of the at the time of recording this video is the older model because there's a, retro, a Redroid Pocket 3, which seems to have some screen issues. So there's a whole discussion about if you should buy the 3 or not because the Retroid Pocket 3 was um, made before the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus um, has a different screen size and th this right here has perfect screen size for all of the retro games so let's switch this on you can see it's uh, 150 p.m. where I am at right now and um, yeah you have pretty much after setup all the things you want. This, by the way, is, I guess, Android 9 running here. And um, you can use all the standard emulators from the from the Play Store. So you have a touch screen here and you can use the Play Store. You can install uh, Frodo for C64, Citra for the 3DS. Um, you can install Scum VM, all that stuff. And I tested this for I guess a month now and it does play a lot of stuff very well. It has this Retroid launcher which is the custom software to use for the emulators and right now I have Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Nintendo 64 which runs flawlessly even the harder to emulate titles, DS which runs flawlessly, um, NES and SNES. It does play GameCube games, which is interesting because you have a handheld GameCube device, which I totally dig because GameCube is my favorite system of all time. 3DS, Wii, which is not much harder to emulate than the GameCube. Um, PC Engine, um, a few arcade stuff. Neo Geo, Neo Geo Pocket, Color, MAME, PSP, which is a little hit and miss. Um, it does some games very well and does have some struggle with some other games. It does do PlayStation 2 um, occasionally, not great, 
Um, it does do PlayStation flawlessly. Sega, uh, Saturn and CD work great. Genesis works great. Master System works great. Genesis uh, 32X works great. Dreamcast works. Wonderswan, Lynx 7800. So you have all these machines which are emulated perfectly. And if we go in here, let me check. We have, let's see, like Animal Crossing. And there's a whole community around this, which provides for custom profiles for the emulators and for the games. So for example, for the Dolphin emulator, which is the emulator which runs GameCube, you get specific profiles which you can download and um, you just select this once and then whenever you play the game, it uses the community optimized settings for that game and emulator, like Animal Crossing here. It's now running at 50, 50 FPS. Um, at 100% resolution. Some games are uh, just shrink down to 70% resolution to increase uh, speed and frame rate. This thing is just great. I really, really dig it. Um, you can do um, quick save and quick load. And you can put on your software via USB-C or with the SD card down here. It has some built-in memory, but it's uh, I guess two gigs or something like this. So you could um, go without a memory card, but I do not recommend that. So that is just a great device. And it, it is sub hundred dollars if you are in the US plus shipping. It did cost me about 200 because I had to ship it here. Yeah, so that is uh, a great device. Comes with a screen protector, which I don't have on here. And uh, so if you are in the, in the market for emulation, and let me show you, you can also use like our favorite C64 emulation. As you can see, I have now my joystick here and my joystick here, and I can bring up the keyboard, but I just forgot how to do this. So now you have a C64 in your pocket, which is also nice. So this is in, in theory, a standard Android device. So everything that runs on this, on an Android phone, Android 9 will run on this. It has a touch screen, perfect screen ratio, all that. So if you are in the market for a retro retro gaming console, this is a Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. The plus is important because you get the proper buttons uh, and joysticks and uh, proper screen. And it's a great device. So I recommend it and I have no affiliation whatsoever with this. Um, as far as I know, stay away from the Retroid Pocket 3. Yes, and that concludes our little video here. Thanks for watching as always and um, until next time. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Retro is the New Black. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe. If you like the video, please share. Every like, share and comment helps a lot. Until next time, bye bye.